Good afternoon. Today I'm going to discuss with you the most updated information in nephrology, but in unusual manner. This is an interactive uh, seminar. S through this seminar, I'm going to discuss 17 points, mainly questions and some cases. Let us start with the first questions. If we have a diabetic patient and diabetic kidney disease, what is the target of glycemic control? from the nephrology perspectives. Yes, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, in early stages of diabetic kidney disease, we tend to strict control of the hyperglycemia, while in late stages of diabetic kidney disease... I agree with you that in early stages of diabetic kidney disease, in stage one and two, so the patient has albuminuria or proteinuria plus preserved glomerular filtration rate. In this scenario, we should strict in the management uh, aiming toward protecting the kidney from uh, progression of diabetic kidney disease. But if we have advanced CKD in a diabetic patient, here we are afraid of hypoglycemia. So our target in early stages is to protect the kidneys and retard the progression or stabilize diabetic kidney disease. Later on, the priority is to avoid hypoglycemia. Uh, because intensive glucose control in the later stages of CKD uh, is reported to be hazardous. But in early stages, it's beneficial. So according to the state and the stage of kidney disease. Also, I would like to uh, show you that the standard of care of management of diabetes 2019 is already released through the supplement of diabetes care, including many chapters about definitions, classification, diagnosis, management, prevention of diabetes. So I encourage all of you to go through all the, the contents of the guidelines of American Diabetes Association through reviewing this supplement of, uh, of diabetes care. As you see here, in the sector of microvascular complication, we are targeting a good and optimum glucose control uh, uh, to reduce the risk or slow the progression of chronic kidney disease and the evidence is A. But don't forget, in advanced stages, we are afraid of hypoglycemia. So in advanced stages, we may accept 7% or even 7.5%, 8%, up to 8.5% if there is an episode, repeated episodes of hypoglycemia. We will be more and more redundant. This is our strategy regarding glycemic control in the presence of diabetic kidney disease. In the guidelines, as you see here, sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors and glucagon-like peptide 1, these are uh, recent drugs that have their way in management of diabetic kidney disease, provided that we have suitable GFR for their prescription and because of their beneficial effect on the cardiorenal aspects. We don't forget blood pressure because blood pressure is an important pillar that should be uh, thought and uh, treated. The most important message that I, 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 I like it because this message and this figure is repeated through the years uh, and it refers to we should individualize glycemic targets according to patient characteristics. For example, if you have patients with potential risk of hypoglycemia or associated hypoglycemia, if it is uh, common here, it is better to be more relaxed and less stringent in your uh, target of glycemic control. Uh, this is duration. If we are starting diabetes, be strict. But in, uh, in, in, in diabetes long-standing, because in long-standing diabetes, there is a risk of hypoglycemia and other comorbidities here, we will be more relaxed. If there is long expected long life expectancy, we should be strict in treating the diabetes. But if we have a patient with expected short life span, why we should be strict? In, in this scenario, it's better to be more relaxed and to avoid intensive management because it will be of no value. If there is important comorbidities here, we should be more and more. If there is severe comorbidity, we should be more relaxed. Uh, and as you see here, we bought the patient 
characteristics in our plan of managing diabetes. And I think this is a very wise approach for to individualize the decisions regarding glycemic control. So this is the, our targets in glycemic control. And don't forget to go through all the contents of this supplement of diabetes care, January 2019. Second question. Do you know the effects of undiabetics on the kidney? If there is any nephroprotective drugs, you know? Yes, all of them. All of them, except the sulfonylurea. Yeah, you are right. Sulfonylurea has no nephroprotective effect, and you will find this within this review uh, that targets this uh, item, uh, the effects of undiabetic drugs on albuminuria. And this table uh, shows that insulin, sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors, the bigonides, TZDs, DB4 inhibitors, and the glibon receptor agonists, all these agents have some nephroprotective effect, and you can read uh, the effects in details in this table. But look at sulfonylurea. Here, as you mentioned, there is no evidence of a renoprotective effect of sulfonylurea. Okay? Let us to shift to heart failure. What is the best class of diabetic drugs in the presence of heart failure in a diabetic patient? Uh, so glucose Why? Why? Yes, you are right. Sodium glucose food transport to inhibitor are the best class if we have heart failure to the extent that nowadays there are ongoing studies and we are waiting the results to treat heart failure even in non-diabetic patients by sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors because this uh, class of drugs are fantastic regarding heart failure. They have anti, uh, they have natriuretic effect, diuretic effect without endangering intravascular compartment. They work mostly on uh, interstitial compartment and they work on sodium hydrogen exchange, exchanger. Not in the kid, not only in the kidney, but also in the heart. And inhibiting sodium hydrogen exchanger in the heart have uh, has its cardioprotective effect and reduces the risk of cardiac damage. So this is the Mayo Clinic proceeding with this interesting review, and this is state of the art review regarding glucose lowering therapies for cardiovascular disease uh, risk reduction in type 2 diabetes mellitus. Here, uh, in all scenarios, lifestyle intervention is the starting point. So we should, we should, no way, we should respect the lifestyle. So calories, avoid smoking, reducing salt intake, encouraging exercise according to the patient's uh, uh, capabilities. All these are the dom dif uh, domains of uh, lifestyle modification. Plus, here, if we are seeking a primary prevention of cardiovascular disease, after lifestyle modification, metformin is the recommended one because it's cheap with many biotropic effects. If then, if, you, if there is no control and the patient is hypertensive, the priority is toward SGL2 inhibitors because they have antihypertensive effect as well. If the patient is obese, after uh, lifestyle metformin, GLEB1 receptor uh, agonist, because even we can use them in managing obese non-diabetic persons. Then DB4 inhibitors, insulin, TZDs, sulfonylurea. So this is the cascade you can use any of this classes uh, after metformin. So the starting is lifestyle plus metformin, and then according to your preference, you can start any of these agents. If you are here, established the cardiovascular disease, but without heart failure, start with metformin, and secondly, sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors, and to avoid sulfonylurea. You can use any of these drugs. Establish the cardiovascular disease with systolic heart failure for the first time. Here, you can see, where after lifestyle modification, use sodium glucose co transporter to inhibitors. And here in Egypt, we have the, the main problem is the cost of this class of drugs because they are a little bit expensive. 
and you can use uh, metformin, but here the uh, GLIB-1 receptor agonist TZDs sulfonylurea are not welcomed here in the presence of systolic heart failure. In patients with transient ischemic attack and stroke, lifestyle and metformin, and you can use any of these drugs, but don't use sulfonylurea. Okay? So this is the, the order of preference of pharmacological treatment of type 2 diabetes according to the cardiovascular risk or disease. And this is the most important and striking uh, paper, Lancet paper, in January 2019 that was released on November, last November. And this is a meta-analysis of the most important uh, trials in sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors, showing that the, this class of drugs um, is essential for cardiorenal protection, either secondary uh, prevention or even primary prevention uh, toward atherosclerosis. So it seems that the tendency is toward encouraging use of sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors, but we should be cautious because you know the side effects. You may have excess infection, fractures, amputation, ETC, so we should individualize our management, but the tendency is toward uh, their prescription. One of the important point, because uh, there is a large observational study known as Cifidril on a very large number of patients, but it's observational study. And here, this is the, the question. Is there any immortal time bias or uh, time lag bias? When we uh, look at uh, Cifidril study or Cifidril study, uh, data, observation data, the answer is... <coughs> Uh, is, is clarified within this article. This is the what's meant by immortal time bias. Here, we can see this is the cohort of patients. These patients will be sodium glucose transporters, and this is the patients on all the drugs. Here, you should know when the drug is started. Although this is an arm of sodium glucose transporter user, but, but the drug was added in this time. And all through this time, the patient is maintained on all the drugs. So the red uh, line here refers to a mortal time, and this is the effect of all the drugs. And here, if you look here, the death rate is almost the same, no, no advantage of uh, prescription, because here uh, we use the older drugs. So whenever you look at survival advantage, comparing old and new, you should look at the starting point to compare from starting points, okay? The actual use of the new drug, not because of uh, classification of patients. This is sodium glucose transporter, but the patient still doesn't consume sodium glucose transporter. It's clear? Regarding time lag bias, if this is diabetes, and here insulin, and we can see that, and this is the diabetes, and this is sodium glucose transporter inhibitors. So we can say that survival after adding sodium glucose transporter to inhibitor is significantly longer than insulin. Is it clear from this figure? It is clear that the, the, we prescribe sodium glucose transporter in a stage of disease not concomitant with the stage of insulin. So whenever you want to compare insulin to sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor, they should be used within the same point of evolution of the disease, like this one. If we start insulin here, and we start sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitor here, this is, and this is the duration of diabetes, and the same moment the patients are treated either by insulin or sodium glucose transporter. You can find here no survival advantage. So survival advantage here of using sodium glucose transporter to inhibitor is biased because we use them early in the disease. And this is late in the disease. So these are two different phases of the disease to the, for the comparison to be a fact and a true we should look at the disease in the same point of evolution. But if you stay, if you start a drug in the late evolution of the disease, 
and then starting another drug in early stages, the survival advantage is because of using drug in early stages of disease and not because of the drug itself. So this is time lag bias. If you want to compare two drugs, you should use them at the same phase of the disease progression. Clear? Because in late phase of the disease, you can expect comorbidities. So these are different characteristics of the patients. They are not the same. <coughs> Do you know any side effects of using sodium glucose transporter to inhibitors on CKD MBD? So this is the, the one of the studies showing the effect of uh, dabagliflozin in, on CKD MBD profile. On phosphorus, here phosphorus is uh, here, this is uh, the drug, dabagliflozin, and this is placebo. What do you see? Phosphorus, serum phosphate, is uh, higher in dabagliflozin. Not only serum phosphate, but also parathormone, intact parathormone, and FGF23. Uh, we don't know the, the, if, if this effect will have clinical consequence later on, so, but I think this note deserves to be followed. What is the value of biomarkers in the management of diabetic kidney disease? Do you know the biomarkers? Actually, biomarkers are so diverse, including inflammatory in inflammation targeting biomarkers, fibrosis targeting biomarkers, angiogenesis, endothelial dysfunction, mineral metabolism, or tubular injury. A lot of biomarkers we have nowadays for all these domains. However, up to this moment, the clinical relevance of the use of biomarkers for diagnosis of diabetic kidney disease is still unclear. And we depend upon the traditional ones, albuminuria, proteinuria, and GFR. And, we, uh, and the, these biomarkers uh, are interesting for research, but up to this point, up, up to this moment, they are not validated in the, in, for clinical practice. This is an interesting case in the Mayo Clinic proceeding, and I like the recent clinics because they discuss the cases with an important clinical note. So, <coughs> I'm not going to discuss this case. This case has glomerulonephritis within the domain of comorbidities and treated with immune suppression. The question is, uh, what is the minimum if this is glomerulonephritis and we give immune suppression? Which one of the following is the minimum dose for allowing or prescribing pneumocystis prophylaxis, cotrimoxazole? Uh, it is 20 milligram or more daily of prednisolone for one month or more, 10 milligram or equivalent dose for one month or more, 20 milligram or more daily for three months, 10 milligram for three months, any anticipated prednisone use for one month or more? The answer is the A, 20 milligram or equivalent, 20 milligram prednisolone or equivalent from other brands of uh, glucocorticoid. And you know the potency, uh, the uh, five milligram prednisolone is one unit. So 20 milligrams means four, four units. If we are speaking about dexamethasone, and the unit in dexamethasone is 0.75. So four units from dexamethasone is three milligram. So 20 milligram prednisolone or three milligram dexamethasone. Or methyl prednisolone, the unit in methyl prednisolone is four milligram. So it is five units. Okay? Five units? Uh, no, uh, five, 20 milligram prednisolone equal 16 milligram. 16 milligram. Missile prednisolone, it is four uh, unit. So if we use 20 milligram prednisolone or equivalent from other types of glucocorticoid for a period, one month or more, this deserves prescription of uh, the prophylaxis against pneumocystis uh, by giving cotrimoxazole. Because cotrimoxazole protects uh, the patient from UTI, pneumocysts, and even nocardia. What are the mechanisms of acute kidney injury in ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome? 
Do you know? Do you know a very high Parsimir syndrome? What the? Um, it's a state of uh, fluid accumulation. Uh, <coughs> so this this is an interesting article that is published still in press in the American Journal of Kidney Disease, discussing acute kidney injury injury due to ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And this is uh, I'm going just to read together the uh, not the case but the clinical presentation of the. Uh, of the ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So this is the, uh, we can read together. We have mild disease, and in mild stage ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, there is abdominal distension, abdominal discomfort, mild nausea vomiting, mild dyspnea, diarrhea, enlarged ovaries. So this is the clinical features laboratory, you will find nothing or no significant derangement. Moderate syndrome, you will find ultrasound evidence of ascites. And you will find in the lab, hemo concentration, hematocrit exceeds 40%, 41%, and leukocytosis. In severe uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, you will find oligoria, clinical evidence of ascites, even hydrothorax, severe dyspnea, intractable nausea, and vomiting. And you will find reduced estimated GFR, electrolyte disturbance in the form of hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypoalbuminemia, and hyper, uh, hypoproteinemia, severe hemoconcentration, hematocrit exceeds 55%, and more and more leukocytosis with elevated liver enzymes. In critical syndrome, critical situation of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, you'll find the anuria, and the patient uh, may need renal replacement therapy, pleural effusion, hypotension, rapid weight gain, syncope, severe abdominal pain, venous thrombosis, arrhythmias, thromboembolism, bricada effusion, massive hydrothorax, arterial thrombosis, adult respiratory distress syndrome, th sepsis, and you will find derangement of the lab as well. So, uh, uh, taking the, the most important uh, uh, teaching points from this case report uh, about the ovarian <coughs> hyperstimulation syndrome, this is the box showing the most important teaching points. This syndrome is an infrequent complication of ovulation induction for in vitro fertilization, mild syndrome is characterized by ovarian enlargement and abdominal discomfort, whereas severe syndrome manifests as the rapid development of tense ascites and variable other consequences of diffuse capillary leak. The pathophysiology related to, is related to exogenous uh, human coronic gonadotropin administration promoting the development of multiple ovarian follicles, which is in release, large amounts of uh, vascular endothelial growth factor and other vasoactive substances into the abdominal cavity. Early uh, syndrome occurs within eight days after human chorionic gonadotropin administration and late may occur within eight, two weeks, triggered by pregnancy-induced uh, human chorionic gonadotropin production. In severe cases, acute kidney injury can occur due to multiple mechanisms. So the answer of the question is within this uh, paragraph. The mechanisms of acute kidney injury include uh, <coughs> intravascular volume depletion, intra-abdominal hypertension and abdominal compartmental syndrome, kidney edema due to capillary leak, and obstructive neuropathy due to ovarian enlargement. Uh, and so we should put these mechanisms in mind because the treatment will target each of these mechanisms. Parasynthesis or caldosynthesis is recommended for both prevention and the management of acute kidney injury because when you do parasynthesis, you will decompress intra-abdominal pressure and to avoid the consequences of intra-abdominal hypertension because intra-abdominal hypertension leads to reduction of kidney perfusion. Okay, is it clear? So I, I recommend this uh, to read this article in details. 
This is an 18-year-old patient with hyperphosphatemia. Normal kidney function, no, no metabolic derangement rather than hyperphosphatemia, and this is the radiology. What is this? This is brain X-ray, and this is CT, both films of CT scan. Showing this, what this? Uh, calcification. So what's your diagnosis? The diagnosis is hyperphosphatemic tumor, a tumoral calcinosis. It is not a tumor because no evidence of uh, tumor in this case. But here we have hyperphosphatemia and uh, calcification and calcinosis. So we should think of mutations of FGF23. So this mutation will lead to hyperphosphatemia and calcification. And so the, the treatment is to focus on lowering serum phosphorus by blocking dietary phosphate absorption and increasing renal phosphate excretion. This case will stimulate all of you to read causes and deficient diagnosis of hyperphosphatemia. So we should think of renal failure, hyperparathyroidism, hypervitaminus D, and others. So if we put the cascade of and the, and the pathway of laboratory diagnosis, we can reach the uh, the definitive uh, diagnosis, and definitive diagnosis uh, is associated with definite treatment. This is another shift. In the last week, we, uh, Professor Tariq Midhat uh, delivered a presentation about urine analysis, and today this is an application toward the importance of urine chemistries. Here, if, you, if I ask you, Muhammad, if you have uranium chloride above 15, what does it mean? Uh, patient might have a metabolic alkalosis. And if it is metabolic alkalosis, it, is it saline responsive or resistant? Uh, I think it is uh, saline responsive. Let us go to the answer. This is the, the article, and I, I recommend the article because it is a very nice review about the uh, selected urine chemistries in the diagnosis of kidney disorders. This is urine chloride. It's maybe uh, less, than, less than 15. So less than 15 means, and in the presence of metabolic alkalosis, you are here dealing with saline responsive alkalosis. So your answer was wrong. Because if it is above 15 and you have alkalosis, it is chloride resistant alkalosis. And in this scenario, you look at blood pressure. Is it normal? You can think of barter, gentleman syndrome, hypomagnesemia, using diuretics, or the patient is hypertensive, so you should shift to renin aldosterone pathway to diagnose increased mnarocorticoid or apparent mnarocorticoid excess. Uh, you may have high urinary chloride with acidosis or even normal acid base. A normal acid status, base status, this may be because of the use of lithium chloride in the presence of anion gap metabolic, high anion gap metabolic acidosis in this, this list may be associated with high chloride in urine and normal gap, this even chronic diarrhea or RTA may be associated with high chloride in urine. So high chloride may be associated with acidosis alkalosis or even normal acid base and you look at the figure to reach your diagnose. If I ask you, and you are a nephrologist, what are the causes of bilirubin? If, if you are a nephrologist, you should speak the scientific language, language of nephrologist. So, <coughs> because bilirubin is either water diuresis or osmotic diuresis. So, uh, we should look at urine osmolarity. But before looking at urine osmolarity, we should check plasma glucose because there is no deficient diagnosis of polyuria without looking at plasma glucose. You should first exclude diabetes mellitus. So and then you can look at the uh, urine osmolarity. If it is less than 100, you are here dealing with uh, primary polydipsia or diabetes insipidus, either central or nephrogenic. And you, we know how to go through the, the differential diagnosis by water deprivation and giving antidiuretic hormone, and this will discriminate between polydipsia, central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. If the osmolarity of urine, and osmolarity of urine is calculated by multiplying the urine sodium and potassium by two, if it is above 300 uh, mosmomol, here you are dealing with osmotic diuresis. This may be uncontrolled diabetes, maybe because of urea, increased protein intake, 
the supplementation or parenteral nutrition or excess catabolism or even mannitol as osmotic diuretic. If you find urine osmolarity is between between 100 and 300, uh, this is the may be mixed the uh, uh, urine, uh, the water diuresis, and solute diuresis. So whenever you ask it, you ask it about the cause of polyuria, you should think of diabetes, and after excluding plasma glucose, you, sh you should uh, look at urine osmolarity. You, are, you may be in the water side or solute side of diuresis. Do you know fraction excretion of urea? Always, when we look at the table that discriminate pre renal from uh, intrinsic renal or volume responsive and the volume unresponsive acute kidney injury, the uh, fraction excretion of urea is written, but we don't focus on fraction excretion of urea. Do you know the role of fraction excretion of urea? I think that we can use it in case of, in case of uh, the patient was using diuretic. Why, why in, in, in case of diuretic it is, uh, it is, um, it is uh, important? Because it's reabsorbed and not... Uh... Let us look at the, uh, the fraction excretion of urea. This is how we calculate fraction excretion of urea is by... Do you know the equation? This is the equation. The clearance of urea divided by the creatine. Perfect. So the, it is uh, urea, uh, urine urea multiplied by plasma creatinine, and then divided by a plasma urea multiplied by urine creatinine in percent. So under condition of volume depletion, proximal absorption of water and urea increases in association with decreased kidney perfusion. So in pre-renal or volume response of acute kidney injury, you will find low fraction excretion of sodium and lower <coughs> fraction excretion of urea because of increased reabsorption of both urea from proximal convertible and salt through the nephron, sodium through the nephron. Clear? Suppose that the patient is, is on diuretics. So diuretics will disturb sodium excretion. Okay? Because loop diuretics works on uh, uh, loop thinly and thiazide work, work, works on thiazide works on this is converted to you. But urea absorption occurs in the proximal converted to you. So if, you, if the patient is on diuretics and you want to discriminate prerenal from uh, uh, volume unresponsive, here I think fraction excretion of urea will be helpful. If you find low fraction excretion of urea, this means increased absorption of urea, it refers to prerenal situation. So this is the value of fraction excretion of urea. Although it is not perfect uh, proven, but this is the, the practical point. So here, cyazides and loop diuretics act distal to the proximal tubule and therefore uh, leave urea absorption un un unaffected. As a result, the fraction excretion of urea is reduced even though urine sodium concentration and the fraction excretion of sodium are increased. So, fraction excretion of, of urea less than 35% suggest low effective volume. And please go ahead and read the details of these articles to know the details and the fallacies of fraction excretion of urea. Okay? <coughs> Do you know what's rocks? It is a risk of a kidney stone. Recovery. Perfect. This is the, and this is calculator, free on Google, if you write, Recurrence of kidney stone calculator. It was released in 2014. You just fill in the space, patient age, gender, type of stone, associated uh, problems, radiological phenomena, uh, and at the end you'll find the rate of recurrence within first year, five year, and ten year. It's fantastic. If you use it in, uh, for patients who, ha who are presented with stone for the first time, it will be fine to put a plan. And this is the paper on the Mayo Clinic proceeding under the same, and this is still impressed, including the detailed risk factors for a stone recurrence. I think it is here in this abstract, so we can read together the uh, risk factors. We'll find the male sex and other factors, including lower calyx and the pelvic stones. If the stone has uric acid, 
uh, if there is radiological phenomena uh, showing uh, within the episode of uh, stone previous. So please read all the risk factors for recurrence of stone and you go to the calculator to see this. This is a patient who have, this is the, this is CT, plain CT without contrast, showing this uh, calc calcification. This is a kidney graft, allograft, and this calcification within this uh, site, okay? The urine analysis shows extreme alkalinization of urine. Urine pH is above nine. If we have the scenario like this, calcification in the pelvis, and here urine, is nine culture is negative. What what is the diagnosis? Diagnosis is alkaline encrust, encrusted by lights. It is a rare infectious disease characterized by the position of strovite within the renal pelvis. Renal transplant patients are immune suppressed, so are more prone to this uh, syndrome. The diagnosis must be considered in any patient, any recipient displaying urinary symptoms associated with culture negative alkaline urine and the calcification of the urothelium on unenhanced CT scan. <coughs> the organism is Corinobacterium urolyticum and this is one of the organisms that lead uh, to leads to uh, alkalinization of urine because it shifts urea toward ammonia. Okay? The problem in the culture, we should, if we wanted to prove it in culture, we should uh, request it by its name because it's fastidious organism. It is gram post bacillus. It is a skin commensal with a tropism for uroepithelial cells. And here the home based treatment is to acidify urine and to uh, give uh, antibiotic like doxycycline. It may act here in, on this organism. This is an ECG. Can you describe the abnormality with this, within this ECG? Uh, I think that the B1 and B2 show a saddle shaped uh, elevation. You are right. This is known as Borogada syndrome, if you find it. But here, this is the patient who presents with renal failure and the hyperkalemia. And this is just after dialysis. If, do you find do you find the changes here after dialysis? Yeah, I think disappeared. disappeared. So this is a, a transient Brugada syndrome because the Brugada syndrome is the syndrome characterized by defects in sodium channel. And this is a mutation and it may present fatally with severe arrhythmias that even leads to death. But here in high, hyperkalemia suppresses uh, sodium channel in the heart leading to this transient Brugada syndrome. You are, uh, you are uh, perfect. This is another patient who presents with uh, renal failure, acute kidney injury, and the, this and the hyperkalemia, and this the right bundle branch block with a tall peak DT wave here. And this patient, uh, this is the laboratory analysis documenting severe hyperkalemia up to 9.6, and more importantly, CPK was uh, 17,000, So this is rhabdomyolysis. And if you read the, the, this case, you'll find sauna related. So sauna with aggressive dehydration may lead to rhabdomyolysis and acute kidney injury. So this is the uh, point that we should consider. And when we have muscle soreness, we should think of uh, rhabdomyolysis and to deal with, with it aggressive, aggressive because the patient may end uh, with this fatal outcome. And this is the... Uh, uh, the one of the important message is if you have um, metabolic acidosis, be careful when you correct the acidosis because with correction of acidosis, they may even depress, ionize the calcium more and more, and this may be associated with fatality. So this is the case. Of, I think this is one of the the first case report about sauna induced acute renal failure due to rhabdomyolysis, and I think because of aggressive loss of weight because of the extreme dehydration in this uh, case. The last point that we, we are going to discuss together is if you have uh, nephrotic syndrome and <coughs> you have a test antiblar and it is positive, 
is it mandatory to do biopsy to confirm the diagnosis of membranous nephropathy, or we may think of uh, no biopsy. The patient has normal serum creatinine with non. So this is. I want just to refer to these two articles within the the issue of the February 2019 Kidney International uh, issue. Uh, here, this is the management and treatment of glomerular disease, part one, discussing IgA and the membranous, and uh, part two, discussing the three glomerulopathy lupus ATC. So please read these two uh, executive conclusions from this conference. And this is the the message. If you have nephrotic syndrome, and then you tested blood by uh, against uh, uh, the antibody against the antiphospholipase E2 receptor, and you find it's positive, assess the patient risk. If uh, he is in the low risk category, no kidney no kidney biopsy may be uh, selected. If the patient is in a high risk group, do biopsy, and then to uh, support treatment and plus an immune suppression. If antiphospholipase E2 receptor antibody is negative, here kidney biopsy should be done and then further categorization of the risk. And the risk is in membranous is categorized either low risk or high risk based on level of proteinuria and urine. If it is less than 3.5, it is low risk. If serum creatinine increased 1.5 milligram per deciliter, it is high risk. If GFR is decreased by 20% between two uh, follow-up with no explanation of this uh, reduction of GFR, uh, this is a high risk. Proteinuria exceeding 8 gram, it's a high risk. Presence of low molecular weight proteinuria, high risk. Urine IgG above 250 milligram, high risk. Blur, antibody levels and evolution, this is, needs to be discussed. So this is, if the blur is increasing and rising tetris, this may be considered a high risk. Even if you start supportive treatment and the blur is increasing, you may shift toward and to reduce the time of supportive treatment. So this is the uh, low risk and high risk to put here in with anti -blur. And within the same issue of uh, Roar 2019, this is the uh, an interesting article about non-invasive diagnosis of primary membranous nephropathy using phospholipase A2 receptor antibodies. And within this uh, uh, study, you will find the two schools According to the uh, the preference of the lab, you can find the lab starting with uh, testing uh, like this, suspected membranous nephropathy, then testing by immune fluorescence testing. So this immune, immune fluorescence uh, for phospholipase in the serum, antibodies in the serum. Uh, then if you find it is positive here, uh, they perform secondly to confirm the presence of the antiphospholipase E2 by ELISA. So starting with um, immune fluorescence and then to confirm by ELISA. If you confirm by ELISA and you find the level by ELISA exceed this uh, limit, you diagnose uh, primary membranous neurobacy and you may avoid renal biopsy if secondary causes are absent and the renal function is preserved. So this is the algorithm. If you find ELISA is less than this value or immune fluorescence is negative in the blood, here you, you perform biopsy. Is it clear? The second algorithm, uh, according to the, the laboratory preference, here the laboratory preference is preferring to start with ELISA. If ELISA from the start exceeding 20, diagnose membranous. Okay, and if ELISA is between 2 and 20, here, uh, confirm by immune fluorescence. If it is positive, so here, diagnose membranous. If it is negative, perform a biopsy. If it is less than 2 here, this is by ELISA, do biopsy. So these are two pathways, laboratory pathways, for using antiphospholipase E2 uh, for diagnosis of primary membranous without performing a biopsy. So we need this uh, work to be replicated more and more to find the uh, conclusion. But for myself, on few cases, I avoided biopsy for patients with nephrotic syndrome and with a risk for doing a biopsy. 
So if you have a patient with nephrosis syndrome, and for example, one of the cases was nurse with evident inferovena cava thrombosis and venous renal vein thrombosis, and here I requested antiblar, and in the blood it was positive, I say it is idiopathic primary, sorry, primary membrane nephropathy because antiblar is positive, and I don't need a renal biopsy because biopsy in this scenario is risky. And this is more and more advanced in this trend is to think if you have excluded secondary etiology like malignancy etc and you have preserved kidney function with nephrosis syndrome and you are sure that antiphospholipase e2 uh, antibodies are positive you can proceed for management of membrane nephropathy without biopsy so uh, i think it is enough and I think through this tour, we reviewed together 17 important points from the updated information nephrology. And I hope it was interesting. And don't forget my key message is, even if you are scientists, full professors in nephrology, you should feel that you are still a student. Because if you uh, forget that you are a student, if a doctor forgets or consider himself not a student, he kills and the doctor inside him dies. To be a good doctor, you should always be a student. Thank you very much for your attention and hoping you all the best.